theology nerds. This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. Yeah, since 2008, we've been bringing you interviews with some of the best thinkers, philosophers, theologians, scientists, and more. And really, here's the goal. Here's the goal. People have all sorts of questions and experiences that get lumped in that category called religion. And uh, I want to think with you. I want to bring some of the best people from the academy right into your earbuds so you can hear what the nerds are doing and then work through it. Think through it for yourself. And today, you get to hear from Kevin Miller. That's right. Kevin Miller is a film uh, a film creator. We're going to be talking about his uh, movie, Jesus USA. Uh, yeah, that's right. Exactly. And it's what you're thinking about. You know, you're thinking about Jesus. You're thinking about the US of A. And you think they might have a twisted and problematic relationship. You know, one where a homeless first century nonviolent Jew who is executed by imperial state power somehow, that guy, that guy, kicks off a religion that becomes popular today in the American empire that uh, has more of its uh, population in prisons uh, than others that has started more wars. Uh, it killed all sorts of people. We, uh, we, we're professional drone operators. Yeah. With missiles on. Them. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying they're easy solutions to any of this. All I know is that this film, uh, Jesus USA, is bringing to the fore that predicament, that connection of nationalism and violence that that is at the heart of American evangelicalism. And uh, in the film itself, which you should go check out, it's at JesusAFilm.com, you know, like Jesus USA, but the U.S. is the end of Jesus and beginning of our initials as a country in the United States of America. Anyway, JesusAFilm.com. The movie itself is a wonderful documentary. It includes really cool people like Greg Boy, Diana Butler Bass, Brian Zahn, David Bentley Hart, Susanna Ross. Anyway, you know what I mean? Like, it's a high quality documentary, provocative. It makes you think. Go to JesusAFilm.com, watch the trailer because it is now available online. You can rent it, you can buy it, you can watch it, you can discuss it, uh, you can do it with a group, you can do it on your own. But if you watch it, let me know what you think because I, I was struck with it. Now, this conversation is recorded uh, live. At the American Academy of Religion this past November, and Robin Henderson Espinosa joins me in this conversation. We talk about their own experience uh, with the kind of white nationalist violence. Uh, we talk about what is it like to use film and documentary to explore these connections. We hear uh, uh, Kevin uh, interview Robin. I ask for interview tips if you're doing this type of uh, documentary work. It's fun, fun, fun conversation. But it, it, it'd make a whole lot more sense if you go check out at least the trailer, which would be on this blog post or at JesusSafeFilm.com. Uh, and and think about watching it. I mean, a lot of us, unless we're like one of those heroes helping people out in the middle of this predicament in the healthcare industry, essential workers and, and all that kind of stuff, a lot of us are trying to uh, stay occupied. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think it's a good one to watch. If you have an older, older kid, like I'm a homeschool, uh, professional at this point, day 44 of a six year old daughter and a older uh, middle school son, th this is a high quality film for, for me to watch with my, with my boy and discuss it because, you know, it's very easy to love the country that you're born into. And it's very easy to come to love uh, Jesus. Uh, we encounter in the text and in the people that love us in our religious tradition, all that kind of thing. But uh, what is it like for him to deal with that conflicted identity as uh, a child of God, a disciple of Christ, and an American? Um, yeah. So maybe you want to do that. It'd be fun. But if you do, let me know. Right. Um, this is a fun conversation. I think when you listen to it, you'll be lured into checking it out at jesusafilm.com. Uh, before we jump in, I want to tell everyone two things. Coming up on Homebrewed Christianity, our next big reading group, starting in June, is with Jeffrey C. Pugh. We're going to be reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, legendary theologian from the 20th century, prophetic resistor to Nazi uh, Germany, and he dies, right? He dies in prison near the end of the war as he, because he was part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. 
So we're going to be reading uh, his his uh, works with a with a Bonhoeffer scholar, and looking at not just Bonhoeffer's own time in historical situation and the way he resisted uh, nationalism and fascism and and had to wrestle with the questions around violence when you serve a nonviolent lord and yet you feel stuck in this situation. We're going to wrestle with all of it, um, and it's going to be so much fun. You can go to Rise of Bonhoeffer.com. That's right. Rise of Bonhoeffer.com or Bonhoeffer.rocks. Yes, I purchased that URL. Bonhoeffer.rocks. And sign up. It is a pay what you can class. And I'm trying to do a number of these while everyone's uh, in lockdown and stuff and open it up so those that have the means to donate and everything can. And those um, that are uh, lost their jobs or, or lost a significant amount of their income like me <laughs> you can't really go speak places for money and when you have a membership group like homebrew christianity and a lot of them lose their jobs they can't keep donating it makes perfect sense so i try to do i'm trying to do some more of these uh pay what you can classes during lockdown so everyone gets to participate those that can donate can those that can't right now don't really need to be like obligated and then we all have some fun reading and wrestling with dietrich bonhoeffer so check it out uh, go to Bonhoeffer.rocks or riseofbonhoeffer.com. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be this June. And uh, you'll get all the readings and stuff if you sign up and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and yes, yes, I, I mentioned the the member group. Anyone that wants to support the podcast can. You can go to homebrewedcommunity.com. Homebrewedcommunity.com. You can join, donate each month. And on top of that, there's a private podcast feed. Yeah. So not only do you get all the different reading groups and everything, so whether they're open to the public or just members sitting there, you also get special lectures like I did one recently on Wolfhart Ponenberg and uh, his work. Um, you'll get uh, a bunch of live talks, uh, some events I did like a whole event exploring process theology. We did Old Testament um, with Walter Brueggemann. There's, there's like uh, probably like 50 or so members only episodes already in there. So clearly it's a good enough reason to sign up. Sign up for just a month. Try it out. And then you realize not only did you get to support uh, high quality theological excitement going to earbuds all across the world, but but you get that private podcast feed and you get all sorts of extra goodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so think about it. Go to homebrewedcommunity.com. And with that, this is recorded live with an audience. In San Diego, back before lockdown, when you could get in a room with a hundred people and craft beverages, and I'm joined by Kevin Miller, filmmaker of Jesus USA or JesusAFilm.com. Robin Henderson Espinosa joins us. It's a good old time. Here you go. As a uh, documentary filmmaker from Canada. How did this topic get on your agenda? I've spent, uh, even though I'm from Canada, uh, I started working in film 13 or 14 years ago, and a lot of that just through the relationships that I formed has taken place in the United States. So I've spent a lot of my time working down in the States, spending time in America, and I feel that uh, that's really had a big effect on my brain in terms of the way I interpret the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I was originally approached to work on this film by a group of American investors who wanted to, um, they wanted to make a documentary that, uh, challenged, um, a lot of the things that we're seeing in the culture, and especially in terms of, uh, some of these violent, uh, images of God that are working themselves out in, in the culture, working themselves out in politics and in churches and that sort of thing. So, uh, th you know, everyone here, those that are listening, won't have seen the whole film. Um, and when you think of uh, successful viewings, like when someone's watched it and the conversation that happens after it is the one you imagine putting all the effort and time into it, uh, what's the big conversation uh, you were hoping to uh, bring to the surface? Well, I'm hoping that it prompts uh, self-examination. I think uh, a big message of the film, I, I'm a... I would say a, a Girardian. I, uh, I, I'm a big follower of Rene Girard, and uh, what Rene would argue is, or argued, is that really the basis of human civilization is is scapegoating violence. We find peace uh, amongst ourselves by by pointing our finger toward a common enemy, so that we can unite against that enemy. 
And then, you know, somebody's going to have to pay, but at least most of us are going to uh, find a way to get along. And uh, I look at really what what the gospel is to me is an undoing of the scapegoating mechanism. It's an exposing of the mechanism. And hopefully what it prompts is us gathering around a victim. In this case, it would be Jesus. And instead of pointing the finger at the victim, Mm -hmm. we go through a process of self-examination. And so that's what I would really hope to see happen. We screened the film at uh, the uh, American Academy of Religion conference yesterday. And the first question that came up after the film was this guy stood up and said how conflicted he felt about what America had done to the Kurds um, in terms of abandoning them at a, at a moment of crisis. And he just felt so personally convicted by that. So I, I would hope that the film would prompt self-examination. I don't go into these types of issues thinking I have the answers. Uh, I go into it with uh, some fear and trembling. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, for those in here, the the bulk of the rest of the movie is like digging deep into the the historical origins of these ideas, both nationalism, violence, and in Christianity, and then uh, peace church resistance and and things like that. Um, were there were there beautiful elements of the church and what it's doing today or its history that you discovered in the process of the film? Yeah, I think anytime you make a documentary, you, you, you have a pretty good idea going in what this film is going to be about. And then about midway through production, you realize you have no idea what this film is going to be about. This film started out being called The Silence of the Lamb. And, uh, until we interviewed Greg Boyd and then he did his Hannibal Lecter impersonation for me. And I thought, no, we got to abandon that title. I never want to see that again. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, just to give you a, a window into the uh, creative process, uh, the title J-E-S-U-S-A, um, came up one day. I was uh, standing in a cheap hotel room in Virginia wearing a towel, nothing but a towel. So put that image into your mind. And uh, my Give son... Give a second. <laughs> yeah. My son was with me. I actually shot this whole film with a two-man crew, myself, and at the time, my 18-year-old son. And uh, we'd been interviewing so many different people. Um, and this issue of nationalism or patriotism and faith and, the, and their their uh, contentious relationship with each other just kept coming up. And so that's where I, I came up with this idea, idea JES USA. And so um, that's, uh, I, I don't know, I, I forget your question, but but uh, just to say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in the filmmaking process that you you kind of think you know going in, but there's a there's a real, uh, I think, filmmaking from your gut and, and uh, giving in to some of those organic moments as they come up is really important. Mm-hmm. So what's it like uh, going native in those scenes? It is a bit like, uh, so uh, going native or it's more like going undercover. So we spent some time at uh, Sean Moon's church in uh, Newfoundland, uh, Pennsylvania, and they're famous for doing this blessing where people reaffirm their marriage vows. And uh, they also were uh, encouraged to bring along a, uh, a firearm of some sort to be included in that because that's a key part of their theology. Um, men and women are kings and queens, which means they have the rights of uh, monarchs, which means you can own land and then you can uh, protect that land. And so that's why that was incorporated. So my son and I spent a couple of days with these folks, and it was uh, it's very stressful. There's a point at which my son was like, that's it, i got to get out of here because... Um, you, I come from a sociological background. That's my educational background. And so I'm a big fan of participant observation. That's where you go into a community and you basically participate in that community as a member because you want to eliminate observer interference. And so when I'm making a film, I try and do that as much as possible. Try and, cause I want to get a clean read on my subjects. And so it's, it, it's stressful because you, uh, are observing things and listening to things and you, have to continually withhold um, your own personal views on the topic. Mm-hmm. Well, so what came to mind when you, was uh, the first time I talked to Morgan Freeman about the story of God show, and you know, in it he visits beautiful examples of every world religion, right? And so I, I'm talking to him about, and he says, oh, you know, it's essential when you experience a context to try to be as present and available to it, and what how everyone that's there that are born into it having is describing what he was trying to do and i said so well you, you said when you started this you were uh s- spiritually committed and a religious free agent i said what where would you locate yourself after you know going into all these contexts he's like i, I just love all of them mm-hmm. and uh it's a the, like the contrast of that to then going into places where if you are you know this is 
uh, for people of faith in America, this is showing you what the two steps dialed up expression is of a lot of people on our Facebook feeds. Mm. <laughs> you know, like there's this, um, uh, and, and I remember, I think for different people, it, the experiences that bring it out. Um, but the first time I watched the film, uh, it wasn't until it got to the first bit with David Bentley Hart, someone was as irritated as I was. Right, who just was really clear there's different Christianities and this and that's not the one he's in. David Bentley Hart uh was quite a interesting guy to interview. There was a point in the in the interview where I said uh, something about when Christianity came to America and he says, Hold on, I want to stop you there. He goes, It's my opinion that Christianity has never fully come to America. And uh he uh yeah, he kind of unpacked that a little bit, but uh yeah, um he yeah, he uh doesn't hold anything back, that's for sure. <laughs> no, and I think he kind of revels in his. I told him he's the badass of the film, and he kind of chuckles at that. So, well, yeah, the, uh, it doesn't matter what the topic is. Um, no opinions held loosely. Uh, so, when, uh, how do you see the question of violence and nationalism connecting to your previous film, Hellbound, and, and thinking about eschatological violence and judgment? Well, I kind of called Or maybe this... say something about the film for those that sure. haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah, so I did a documentary. Uh, it's scary to think how long ago that was. It came out in 2012, seven years ago, called Hellbound. And it was a film that was uh, uh, questioning the idea of eternal conscious torment and, and really trying to ask the question, is universalism a viable uh, option for people who want to remain somewhat within what we would call Orthodox Christianity. But that was really contextualized within the whole 9-11 um, attacks we filmed uh, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And, and it was looking at the question of how do we deal, yeah, I mean, eschatologically, how do we deal with the problem of violence without, and, and how do we imagine how God deals with violence without God ultimately becoming the biggest terrorist in the universe. And so mm-hmm. I look at this film as a... Um, as a quasi sequel to that film because um it's it's asking that question not just about hell but about a lot of other things i have a good friend named uh, michael harden uh who is himself a uh, interpreter of rene girard and and he talks about the four pillars of evangelicalism um one being eternal conscious torment another being uh in inerrancy in terms of uh, scripture one another one being divine violence and then penal t- substitutionary atonement so what this film hellbound went after hell this film goes after the other three um, to try and deconstruct these things and and uh, see if we can imagine a better way to conceive of uh, this thing called the gospel. So are you optimistic that Christianity might ever come in America? <laughs> um, you know, I think we're in a period of extreme overcorrection right now. You hear a lot of things uh, about how toxic organized religion is. But, you know, there's something that's more toxic than organized religion, and that's disorganized religion. And even more toxic is reorganized religion. And I think the reason why I say that kind of half-jokingly is because I think there's a growing sense of certainty about how right you are. Um, and so many times we're forming our faith around, unwittingly we're forming our faith and our identity around a scapegoat, around an enemy. Um, so the enemy could be up there. Like right now, we're at a point where we're, who can you point the finger at without any fear of repercussions? Big pharma, big ag, big banks, big government, anything big, anything at the top. So we're, we're definitely trying to deconstruct all these things. But you know, once you've deconstructed everything, uh, and then you try and reorganize, you, you're, you're going to end up oftentimes reorganizing yourself around some kind of a bad guy. And really, that's one of the main arguments around this film is that, I think what the gospel offers us is a way to form identity, to form community where we don't have an enemy. And that's a hard thing to even conceive of. How do we even know who we are then? Um, but uh, that's that's one of the key things that this this film explores is it, it just trying to deconstruct this question of violence down to really what is the uh, you know what is what is the actual foundation of Christian community and and hopefully civilization that grows around that. Mm-hmm. And when so if someone is new to using documentaries for like starting conversations and all that kind of thing, what kind of advice do you give to someone who learns about this, checks out the trailer and all that kind of stuff, and is like ah. I want to bring this subject up and still have friends when I get done. Well, my first piece of advice is buy the film, rent the film, spend some money. 
Uh, if, if you believe that this conversation is important, support the people who are trying to make the conversation happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not talking about me. I've already been, I've already made my money. What I want to do is get my investor his money back, their money back so that they can go on and do other projects. Um, uh, but the second thing is, is that, you know, a film like this is never going to be the last word on a topic. Um, I think that hopefully it will be the first word, maybe the second word, but hopefully it's going to be something that inspires you to go deep into, uh, the subjects we bring up and the people who are featured in the film. I look at my role as somebody who, who is smart enough to understand really smart people, not quite smart enough to be one of those people, uh, but at least I can kind of interpret what they're saying, um, and, uh, curate what they're saying into a way that a lot of people can consume. And so I, I would, you know, hope people go deep into a lot of the people who are featured in the, in the film as well. Mm-hmm. All right. So last question that I have right now is, when you begin a project, you said like you change directions and stuff. Um, how how do you decide you're going to say yes to something that will occupy years of your life? Because those of us that are professional academics, um, we have to do that with books. And sometimes the last hundred pages, you regretted each one. Uh, so I was hoping maybe you'd have some advice <laughs> as a no if the person that is the creator uh, is ready to carry the question all the way through? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because when you make a film like this, uh, like we, I had a first meeting on this film in February of 2018. And it takes roughly about a year to get a film like this shot and edited and to the point where everybody's happy with it. But then the real work begins, which is the work I'm doing right now, is is letting people know about the film and then putting a lot of time and effort into spreading the word. So, and initially I actually said no to doing this project um, because, uh, uh, you know, I'm getting harder and harder to work with the older I get. Um, I just, you know, I always used to say, you know, it, it takes a village to make a movie, um, and uh, you have to be able to play well with others. But the more um, the more you do this, the more singular you get about what it is that you want to say. So I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if I have advice for any graduate students trying to finish finish their PhD. But um, uh, you know, whatever you do, dig into. You have to really believe in it. I couldn't work on a film like this. It takes so much out of you unless you really believe in uh, the importance of what it's saying. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of myself in the film. And, and uh, you know, I used to say to people that, you know, especially writers, if people criticize your work, don't take it personally. They're not criticizing you. They're criticizing the work on the page or on the screen. I'm like, I, I'm c- completely reverse that. If you haven't put yourself on the screen or on the page, uh, if it doesn't really hurt when people criticize it, you you didn't take it far enough. So maybe that's put everything into it i guess mm-hmm. awesome well uh maybe say the website and stuff so that if people are listening and not driving <laughs> uh they can go look at it and, and find out where it's all available and such yeah check it out on jesusafilm.com and we're at js jesusa film everywhere else have you thought about the person that goes to it just because you have such an amazing website address and they get the film and they're like I love freedom and liberty so much. That's praise Jesus for America and Trump. And then they get the film and are like 10 minutes in and send you the email, both probably about eternal conscious torment, along with a refund request. Um, and uh, maybe it's like if you watch the whole movie and send me a 500-word reflection, I'll refund your money. Yeah, the other problem is if you read it, it says Jesus a film, and they might be really confused then, yeah. Oh, All right. Well, everyone put their hands together as my friend Dr. Robin Henderson Espinosa comes and joins the conversation. And what's up, Robin? Hey, Trip. So, Kevin, this is my friend Robin. So, Robin has a new book that just came out called Activist Theology. And maybe you want to introduce the kind of work you do because uh, I mean, you've seen the whole film, so there are there are elements of the places that you're involved as an academic that connect to the constructive proposal at the heart of the film. Well, let me first say the film is amazing. Um, I I too dabble in film. I like to say that I have a film guy, and I'm the director of the films that we make. Um, I think narrative and 
constructive intellectual discourse via film is one of the best things that we have going for us right now to do culture shift. So the film is remarkable. Um, the, the, other, I mean, the other thing about the film is that, and I don't need to say this to anyone who's here. We live in a polarized world. We live in a world where politics continue to be, um, on the fringes and we don't actually know how to be human with one another. And what this film actually does is invites us to do what I call activist theology, which is have a new vision for humanity. And, um, I'm an unabashed pacifist. I, I, I believe in peace, love, and, um, we should do that as much as we can. Um, and yeah, you know, my book is, is a narrative response, uh, of my own story really around becoming a theologian and asks a lot of questions. For example, if you read the book, why did my father, why did my white father, I'm born to a Mexican woman, not of this country. She married a white man. I'm a mixed race Latinx. I'm white passing. Um, why did my white father have undocumented workers working his land? That is violence on lots of, on lots of levels. And there's a way in which you can read the film and really watch the film as a fold of activist theology bringing narrative to the forefront, really getting the stories of what people are living, um, and really getting a close, I mean, we saw in the first 12 minutes, like, people's politics, their values. And there's something really potent about that in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And I think that this film... I would love to put a link to this film on our, on our activist theology website and to point people to a constructive response to how do we live in a world that is riddled with violence? What is our response to that? I would love to do that. I'd love you to do that. <laughs> and not just so your investors get their money back, <sighs> no. but actually so that we can be the kind of humanity that we're called to be. This mm -hmm. is about a new vision of humanity. Well, and let me just speak to my investors, too. I mean, my investors, uh, you know, uh, it's funny. Uh, I'm the one who keeps trying to convince them they need to get their money back. Uh, they're like, we just want to make this film available to as many people as possible with as few barriers as possible. So, yeah, I think that's great. Well, and let me just say, what, when I was sitting there in the pew next to Jeremy, I texted my comrade, Josh Scott, who pastors Grace Point Church in Nashville. I know that the conference, the Theology and Peace Conference, is coming to Nashville in the summer, and I texted Josh where I occasionally attend church. I know that's going to be a big um, surprise to the <laughs> listeners that occasionally Dr. Robin goes to church. But I texted my comrade Josh, and I said, I would love to show this film at Grace Point and help people connect the dots, because I believe the thing that is missing, and I, you know, I'm a scholar activist. I teach at Duke Divinity School. I'm a visiting scholar at Vanderbilt. I love academia. I'm deeply socialized as a theologian and ethicist. But my call and vocation is to help people connect the dots. And I believe that's what your film does. And so I texted Josh Scott, the pastor of Grace Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee, and said, let's have an event for this, for this film. And so Nashville is going to get it at some point. Awesome. All right. So I didn't tell either one of you I was going to do this. So this all might get edited out of the podcast. Um, but you know, that's what. That's what editing is. So uh, in activist theology, uh, you tell stories from your time on the ground in Charlottesville. You're a documentary filmmaker that uses on-the-ground experiences and narrative to bring things to the surface. So tell the story, but then you start asking questions like a documentary filmmaker and see how different they are than every time you and I have talked about it. Because I'm, I mostly am interested in, when watching the film because not all the time your voice isn't there. Sometimes it is. But when I hear it, I go, I know there's no chance that would have been my follow up question. Uh, I immediately go to the ideas, the most abstract way of dealing with it or whatever. And I, when your voice is there and then when you see what comes out of even people that have been on the podcast before, like I'm like, 
I've talked to Greg for like five hours and nothing that sweet and succinct ever came out of his mouth. Decided that a PhD talking to a PhD can't do it. Um, so, you know, this is like in your natural habitat game. So uh, now this is a chance for us to be public scholars, I right. think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you start telling your story. I'll just say action or something, you know? I don't know how that works. Never done it. I feel like this might be Oscar worthy. Yeah. I mean, if you're the judge, I know that you'll choose me. Correct. So even though this is yet to happen, I would like you all to see the next award-winning documentary film, uh, Kevin talking to Dr. Robin, called uh, Charlottesville, question mark, exclamation point. So I was in Charlottesville during the Unite the Right um, terrorism, actually. In Charlottesville, Virginia. In tell me, tw- tell me the time. What, what? In 2017, 2017, August 12th, 2017. Okay. And it was publicized all over the news. And I went there as, um, they had a call for white clergy, but I felt as a mixed race, white passing Latinx that I should be there because I also do public theology. Most of my work is in the public square. And so I went to Charlottesville. And I stood on the corner of Second and Water while neo-Nazis, right-wing militia groups took the streets. And I stood there, and there was a moment when neo-Nazis lunged in my direction at the corner of Second and Water. Targeting you individually or just uh, you were? Well, it's hard to tell. Mm. It's hard hard to know because I was standing also next to a black woman. Mm. But they lunged in my direction, and Antifa, the anti-fascist group, absorbed the violence that may have been intended for me. And at that moment, it becomes very blurry. I was I was picked up by my security detail, put into a, a an enclosed area where the Virginia State Police did nothing. And and then at that point, um. Cans, like Coke cans filled with concrete began to be lobbed in our direction. That was one day. The day before, we were in a church and we were on lockdown because the the alt-right, the neo-Nazis, the Proud Boys, today's KKK began marching with tiki torches and surrounded the church and we were on lockdown. And so it was a very, very intense time to be in Charlottesville. And I live with a lot of PTSD from that time. And I think we don't realize the impact of violence that, that we internalize. Um, so that outcome in terms of you actually being personally targeted, was that something you considered beforehand as a possibility that that might happen to you? You know, I, so I should also say that I identify as a non-binary transgender person who's also Latinx. And, you know, I've used, you know, the ba- I have a lot of bathroom anxiety because um, I don't know, I don't know which bathroom I'm going to be kicked out of. And so when there's a family restroom, I feel really comfortable. And so when you ask the question about being targeted, I, I don't know because I've been kicked out of both bathrooms. And so I think in this moment, I'm so unintelligible to these people that, that maybe, maybe they intend violence for me and, and, and actually metabolizing that thought that someone could intend violence for someone else is the most inhumane thing that I think that we could produce in our society. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, um, to be targeted for something that just because of a certain category you either fall into or don't fall into, I mean, it just seems so offensive. Um, what about, uh, can you remind me of the name of the founder of the Proud Boys? Gavin um, McInnes? Maybe. You know, there, there's also the guy whose name I can't recall, I write about him in my book, but he calls himself um, an identitarian. Mm. And I'm, 
forgive me, I can't remember the name. Does anybody remember the name of these alt-right leaders? I, I try to flush them from my memory. But he calls himself an identitarian. And, and you know, these the, the ways in which they use identity politics to further their message is is a type of violence, is a type of relational violence. Well, and I guess the question I have is, did you at any time... So Gavin McInnes, I've listened to him talk before, um, and uh, he's, of course, since walked away from the Proud Boys. But, I mean, there is an ideology. Did you get a sense on the front lines of people who are potentially going to bring violence against you that these are ideological individuals or are these people who are... Uh, responding to some other kind of incentive. Well, uh, sort of both and that, that there, they were responding and also they were trying to, um, footprint their ideology. And, and, and how do you respond to that? Footprint as in on your face? Well, I mean, like your, your, your footprint as in create, create traction, build a runway. Okay. Um, but but that's a great question on your face, right? I mean, I I think that when we live in a world of violence, I and I'm and I say this as often as I can, we live in a world of violence. We privilege a culture of violence. We live in a world where the religion is white nationalism, and that is violent making. Well, did that? That's uh, it. Made me think about. Uh... Gandhi didn't want anyone following him who wasn't willing to take up a weapon in defense of what they believed in. In other words, he didn't want somebody who kind of pretended as if they were somehow above violent tendencies. You know, um, did that trigger any kind of uh, desire to, uh, you know, employ or at least a yeah a desire to employ violence yourself or this some a, kind of a yes? Yeah, is a great venge- question. Vengeful feeling. This is a great you. question. Like, were you grappling with that inside, like a hatred toward these guys? This or? is a great question. Um, I have loads of compassion for these people, and in fact, Christian Picciolini, who is an anti-hate educator and, and former neo-Nazi, is a friend of mine. Um, but just following the Charlottesville incident, my mom, who is a Mexican woman, not of this country, said, "You need to get a gun." And she, and she has had guns. She has several guns. And not once did I think that I needed to have a weapon because I actually don't believe that privileging, um, warfare is the way to bridge our differences. But did you feel, I mean, that, did you feel that uh, maybe you, you didn't so think look, tactically, but was there what was going emotionally? You're traumatized. But look, is, I'll tell you. Did you ever get to anger? I'll tell you. My hotel was compromised in Charlottesville. Someone tried to break into my room while I was there. I was moved to a secure location where no one knew where I was, where I couldn't hardly get out of Charlottesville because no one knew where I was. Not once did I respond with a tinge of violence. Mm. Now, that's not, I don't, I don't want to like herald myself as like being a virtuous person, but I just don't think violence is the answer. Mm -hmm. And so when, but you know, some people will say, well, if someone hits you, will you, will you hit them back? I hope not. I mean, I just don't think violence is the answer. So there, there was an incredible amount of, of compromise when I was in Charlottesville. And not one time did I feel that my response needed to be violent. Mm-hmm. Um, and did you, was there a subsequent uh, opportunity to dialogue with any representatives from these groups? No. And in fact, when I returned home to Nashville, I had to move to a secure location because I was re- receiving unmarked packages to my home. And I had to find an apartment where I could live that had some semblance of safety and there's been no conversation with any of the alt-right groups. And, and I, I'm willing to sit down with people. I think I'm a fairly reasonable person and, and our world is already polarized between right and left. And I actually don't believe that's the answer, Mm -hmm. but no, there's been no opportunity. Yeah. Gee, see, I told you you're good at this. 
So, so can, I want to ask you a question. So what started the Charlottesville thing were people that were pissed. One of the most racist parts of the country was getting rid of a statue to a Confederate general. Yes. So like your movies wrestling with this nationalism, the violence and stuff and touches some on the race things, but like, from your I'm getting to know you American Christianity and your violence predicament, like have you had any observations or experiences about the way race plays a unique role in um our uh cult of violence? Well, this is where Canada is starkly different from the United States, and it, I think it just definitely has a lot to do with the history or very different history of our countries. I mean uh I think Toronto is now the most cosmo, cosmopolitan city in the world. Um, and um, we, like America, are a nation of immigrants. Um, we also are a nation that committed some uh, horrific crimes against the native population of our country. But race is... Um, it is... Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which burner on the stove it is in Canada. I mean, it definitely is there. Um, especially with some of maybe the more recent tensions over immigration, but it is so off the charts here. It's, it's hard to, it's hard, really hard for me to understand. Um, so I guess I would just say I don't have any tremendous insights, but it's, uh, it, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, Sam Harris, uh, philosopher, podcaster Sam Harris, who, he dreams of a day when race is the least interesting thing about us um, because uh, we've come to see that, you know, we've we've made we've made it the most important thing for reasons, I guess, that are maybe have to do with history. But it uh, I guess it just yeah, I, I can only just look here as a stupefied Canadian and, and wonder why does this continue to be such a divisive thing in America? Um, yeah, it's it's puzzling. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that I uh, like when you asked the question about to Robin if they had violent responses. Uh, I mean, I'm getting the random text updates from Robin throughout this process. And when you think of uh, when I see rednecks angry and racist, I just assume I was friends with them in high school, right? Like I'm from the South, and every white guy from the South is friends with those people. Right, and they, they're on your Facebook feed and you, you're like, ah, mute. Um, uh, and you, uh, maybe I pray for them. I don't know, but so I'm getting it. And in my head, those, like, they're threatening someone you care about and they're standing up for something that's abhorrent to you. And, uh, also I'm a white dude from the South. So when you get upset, you obviously should punch each other. And I'm like, which is what they do in Scotland, apparently. Yeah, that's also not different. But there, you just drink afterwards, and they're friends. Um, I, good old boys. When like sometimes you settle things with a fight, and right. I just remember getting these text updates and not getting something from Robin, and be like, "Man, I'm gonna have to go down there and beat some redneck up." Like, and, and so like when you hear like no violence coming, it, emerging, and Robin, I got like five text messages, and I'm ready to go down. Uh, I'm like, ah, oh, well. <laughs> well, but I wonder if what what that says about the ways in which we socialize men in this country. Yeah. Right? Around masculinity. And even as a non-binary, trans-masculine person, my appeal is not to violence. It is to relationality. And so I wonder if you're... And of course, I was reaching out to everyone that I knew because I didn't know if I was going to make it out. And so... Part of my communication during that time is like, hey, I want y'all to know where I am Mm -hmm. and what's going on. And your immediate reaction is, I'm going to have to kick some ass. Now, I think some ass needed to be kicked. But I wonder if what kind of ass kicking do we need to be doing in this world? Is it, does it need to take a violent trajectory or is there a way for us to sit down and and actually hear one another into speech? It, in the question that comes to my mind, and I don't think I'm in a position where I get to answer it, is that patience from the oppressed means they remain victims of institutions that produce passive violence. But like, so not that long after that, when you were pulled over by a cop. Right. And have an experience so different than mine, 
we talk and I'm like, I'm friends with a lawyer in that town. Right. Like, but that's how I would have experienced it. It was really different. Right. Right. And so, so, so but one even, of the things like when I listen to people that are wrestling with what it means to be nonviolent, when you're also so often the object of right. passive violence, right. Like I, I don't, like I don't judge my friends that are like, white supremacy sucks. Maybe yeah. you should hit somebody. Well, you know, that instance where I was pulled over by the Kentucky State Police and was at litter, I'm going to tell you what happened. I was asked to lift up my clothes to show that I had no weapons on me and then was asked if I was a terrorist. I'm assuming because I wear a hoodie that says activist theology, that's my collaborative project. I do scholarship and activism. I'm trying to respond to the needs of the world through peace and yeah, but love. Where, and why were you in Louisville? I was in Louisville for the Society of Christian Ethics. Right. So I get pulled over by the Kentucky State Police and um, I'm I asked to be lifted up my my clothes. And of course, I'm exposing all of my bo- my top half of my body. Right. And then I'm asked, am I a terrorist? I'm also wearing a Black Lives Matter pen with my hoodie that says activist theology. And so. In that moment, I'm a recipient of, of passive violence, but also in that moment, I'm expected to respond appropriately to avoid being killed, right? So there's a constant negotiation going on. And so I am subdued by the Kentucky State Police so that I can, so that my car is not impounded. And, and the thing that gets me is, is that our world only has a response of violence. That, that's the only response that our world has right now. And so my constant question and my constant urging for people is, how do we build the kind of world we want to inhabit? How do we build, how do we be the kind of people we want to be? Because no one should be asked if they're a terrorist just by wearing a Black Lives Matter pin or a hoodie that has a red fist that says activist theology. If you read my book, it's a book about story. So Robin mentioned that Antifa stepped in and absorbed the violence at the protest. I thought of there are two interesting implications for that that could be discussed. One relates to her experience and one to the film. Um, first of all, uh, they don't advocate violence, but Antifa does. And Antifa was there to absorb that. And then secondly, I think a lot of the people in the film, or certainly members of the military, see their own job as precisely to be mm-hmm. there and absorb the violence so that we don't have to absorb it. And it reminds me of, I, I'm very pacifist leaning in my theology. The one argument from the right on this that I've had the hardest time with, David Frum said this in an interview once. He said, since World War II, since the United States has been the head of, you know, uh, international military complex, in 75 years, there have been no nuclear bombs dropped on anyone, and there have been no wars between superpowers in 75 years. Now, that's good. I want that. What is the cost of that? What are we doing psychologically and physically to our young men and women to put them in harm's way of that? Uh, these are really hard questions. I wonder, from the film perspective, if that kind of um, sort of difficult middle ground came up and, and if you have any insight from doing your interviews. Well, I'll say uh, I feel licensed to criticize David Frum, because seeing as how he's a Canadian as well, mm. um, <laughs> who is benefiting by living within uh, behind the mighty walls of the fortress of America. Um, 75 years without superpowers going to war or dropping a nuclear bomb. I mean, I, I, what price are we paying for that? Ask the people of Iraq, ask the people of Afghanistan, ask the people of, uh, let's see, El Salvador, ask the people of Vietnam. Uh, we could just go on and on and on and on. Um, you know, uh, I think that there's, you know, a lot of people think that nonviolence or pacifism is naive. Um, I would say, let's, if you want to see naivety, t- talk to people who think by dropping another bomb, we're going to create peace. When has that worked? I'm a big fan of Martin Luther King Jr., who said that violence solves no social problems. It only creates new 
and more complicated problems. And I think that uh, the last 75 years have been a witness to that over and over and over again. Um, you you get rid of uh, you know one group and you you end up getting a group that is so cemented uh, because of the violence that you used. And you know that's something that Rennie Girard says is that. Violence uh, works against itself because whenever it succeeds, it becomes a model uh, for the, especially for the ones who it was used against. Oh, that's what it takes to get by in this world. I'll do that next time. So that's the height of naivety. So um, in my work in research, I do a lot of interviews also, and one of the things that we do is loop back to the people we've been interviewing and ask them if the way that we've presented their information. Um, fits with how they would, if they agree with it. Um, so I'm just wondering if there was any of that loopback process for you, Kevin, in your, in your work in terms of, uh, did the participants see the film? Um, what did they think of it? Um, and how did that go? I haven't heard back yet from everybody who's appeared in the film, but I think that what you're talking about is steel manning as opposed to straw manning or straw personing. And I think that's really important. And for me, um, it's actually to my advantage as a filmmaker to try and have somebody represent their viewpoint as clearly as possible. Because I don't want to, why would I want to distort it? Because I, I'm talking to them because I want to hear what they have to say. So I have, I don't ever go back to a subject and go, do you like the way you're portrayed in the film? Uh, because I'll never be able to release a film. I have a hard enough time getting my investor team to agree that the film's, you know, gonna go, th- go ahead. Mm. Uh, so if I get everyone involved, uh, it'll never, you know, you can't make a film by committee, but I just feel personally I'm committed to, you know, I, I want to be able to go back because I, I genuinely enjoyed my interactions with these people and I want to be able to not be afraid to encounter them in the airport sometime, which might happen. Oh yeah. Questions? So I'm a digital marketer. I spend a lot of money on Facebook buying ads and they're super effective, but I'm not influencing people politically or religiously, but I can see where it works because the data points are endless. Um, it's been super effective the last five, six years as older generations get on online. This is our first rodeo online. Their filter is uh, not the best. You know, they have sometimes a hard time deciphering what's real and what's not, and sometimes accept things immediately. Uh, with that being how it is now and seemingly how it's going to continue to be, what do you think the answer is when we live in a world where it's easier to put out information that might not be true faster than it is to put out truth? Um, how does this work for people who are in bubbles that only hear what they agree with, us included, or maybe the people in the documentary? Are you putting that question to everybody? Me? Well, yeah, you and everyone. Well, I think that we're at a point where we have to be proactive about engaging people who don't agree with us. I think that one of the worst fears we seem to have today is to be offended. Oh, I was offended by something somebody said. And, and, uh, it's like, well, I think we, you should be offended every day. Um, and I purposely try and, you know, I, I have a policy on something like Facebook, you know, that old, uh, social networking system we used to use. Um, uh, but I never block anybody. Um, and I've been involved in some pretty nasty online stuff because of a lot of the films I've worked on over the years. Uh, and because I feel, I'm, I'm 48 years old, almost 49. And you know, the big, the big takeaway from being in my forties is that I'm wrong about most things I feel most passionate about. And, uh, it's, I, I find that there's, I think it's, is that the Dunning Kruger effect? The more emotionally attached you are to position, probably the less you know about the position. And so um, I think it's important that the things that trigger that response in us, that we engage that as much as possible, because that's an opportunity to reveal some blind spots in us and, uh, you know, give us a chance to grow, even though it's frustrating and painful to be proven wrong over and over again. So what comes immediately to mind is like a giant fear I have that I have no solution for, so I, I hope you all sleep well, um, <laughs> is that... We have made it extremely effective, efficient, and cheap to hack humans 
because we've come up because of marketing money, ways of cultivating our anxieties and our tribalisms and such uh, that because the algorithms are looking for responsiveness, we don't understand or consent to what's going on, right? Like at least if you are getting loaded, you open the beer, but all you did was turn your phone or your computer on and a notification comes up and a family or a friend is saying something over the top and it just feels good to agree with someone or to hate them because they're ignorant or whatever. Um, I don't know what it looks like to have conversations where realities that are not ones that are immediately sensible to you uh, shape your discourse, shape your thinking. When the, in a democracy where a lot of us have had our emotions hacked and don't know it. And that's true on the left and the right. So like when I started doing research for this, for this class, both Ryan and I've taught before on, um, faith in a digital space. Uh, if you like the homebrewed Christianity Facebook or, uh, Instagram page, you were part of an experiment where I ran ads for the same episodes and, with different titles and the titles I was most uncomfortable with because they were sweepingly dismissive of large parts of the body of Christ who were born in different families and different parts of the country with different experiences of me that I hope get the dignity they have as images of God. Even if I find what they're saying detestable, if I minimize them and made fun of them, everyone that likes those pages clicked on it significantly more. And I made more money. Um, uh, 70,000 people listen to the podcast every month. I've run nine different ads in the last six months about if you listen all the time, joining and donating every month. The one ad that I feel guilty running is the one that 80% of the new donors every month clicked on. So I say that because I like to pay my bills. And when he brought up earlier, like you want to pay back your donors is because when you're trying to do something like equip people to have just a little bit better conversation or a little bit better thought process on something. Even there, you have this temptation of what you do with the tools we have for marketing and, and consciousness hacking. Um, and that has nothing to do with what I would justify myself for Trump not to win. So if I was a campaign director, I absolutely know I would not care about having the most rational campaign, the most plans. Like every time Warren says, I have a plan for that, I think that's why you're losing. Because it's not about plans. Majority of the people that you're trying to persuade don't give a shit. Ang- grab their anxiety and manipulate it to your well-being because you already know you're right. And I agree with her. I would love, she reminds me of my mom. I hope she's president. Um, <laughs> but like, I just say all that because like your question like creeps me out. And I don't know what the solution is. Anyway. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to do some, some psychologizing about yeah, it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, so, hey, I'm Cutter. Um, it, I think one of the things that you individually need to ask is what your moral culpability is in the endeavors that you're embarking upon. Because you wield more power probably maybe than you realize, or the question uh, suggests that you actually realize it. Um, does any of us here think, I mean, Facebook started in 2007. No one in 2007 said, about 10 years from now, this guy, Mark Zuckerberg, will be standing before Congress being blamed for the fate of democracy in the world. Um, and yet he is. And when Elizabeth Warren says we're going to uh, challenge Facebook's monopoly over the digital space, he immediately says, I'm not in on that. Why? Because he has uh, a fiduciary responsibility to Facebook. He doesn't care about us. Um, now, they're actually actively investing grant funding for realizing that Instagram, for example, oh, it turns out doesn't promote empathy. Uh, it, it encourages <laughs> jealousy. Every like, youth minister is yeah. like, really? You're saying that teenagers sitting there with pictures of everyone so, in their happiest moments? Yeah, so, so Zuckerberg is funding grants that are trying to encourage social scientists and uh, uh, people that are working in social media spheres to develop apps that 
encourage, uh, you know, uh, the, the opposite of that, right? Okay, great. But all for the sake of the bottom line. And now you start talking globally. There are about literally less than five multinational corporations that actually own us all. Now, when you start talking big data algorithms and the psychology of it, what's fascinating is you don't have to on the, on the ground, like affect what Trip does, his behavior. But because we have actual new math, um, that's been driven by, by the first time in human history. Um, so th- let's talk advertising before, um, you know, Mad Men or whatever, like, oh, let's go get people to smoke. There wasn't actually any direct connection between the advertising that they did and people's behavior. There was some assumptions. There was some like instincts. We, you know, we thought maybe we saw some trends, but now you have actual behavioral patterns all mapped on the digital space. Um, and we're actively manipulating. And as you're saying, we have data to back up how, if I can just get these three billion people to shift a half of a percent, that is a huge windfall financially for me. Yeah. Um, now if you're a, let's say a Jaron Lanier fan, anybody? Yeah. He's my, my man crush. Um, and he helped actually develop uh, web 2.0 is now sort of developing web 3.0, um, and says one of the, th- the problems that we face is we're, we're suggesting that, um, the, the system is broken. And he says, I think rightly, no, 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 no. The system is working exactly as it should. Um, not as it should, but as it was designed to, yeah, to yeah. function. Um, and it's designed to amplify polarization. It's designed to blind you from the perspective of others. It, and, and it's designed to be financed that way. I mean, like what you're describing the, with the podcast, now you get backers saying like, well, I'm going to invest advertising dollars only in the spaces where there's the most likes. And the most likes are the things that you most hate. Um, and it just amplifies the whole thing. So um, then when it gets back to the question of empathy, let's say. So Lanier would say, if empathy is driven by this basic human proposition that for a moment, in whatever way I can, I can see the world through the viewpoint of somebody else. I can walk in their shoes for a second. The the social media sphere right now, especially with digital advertising, is such that it's literally impossible. My feed is so hyper-customized to me, I don't know what the world of trip even looks like. I, I literally cannot empathize with you, and it's specifically designed by the way that these the architecture of, of uh, advertising right now. So the two things that I think through is, one... Uh, we need to somehow get off that system. Um, we need to, we, we are owned in the digital space. Our, our, all of our information is owned. We give it away willingly. We actually consent to it with the, I agree buttons. Um, and so there's some like blockchain answers, stuff like that that you can do. But on the other side, the hopeful point is that you're, it's interesting you said the older generation is more prone. Is that what you had said to, to some of those things? So an anecdotal evidence, my dad, he's, you know, 75 and he's the worst offender with like Facebook and being on his phone and family gatherings and sharing stuff. I'm like, dad, you know, this is actual fake news, right? Like this is not real. <laughs> he doesn't know. He's just sharing it with everybody. Um, and, uh, uh, six months ago or so, my daughters, I got uh, nine, seven, four year old daughters and they love watching slime videos on YouTube kids. Um, and they were telling me they saw something and they're like, and I watched it. I'm like, Oh, what's that? And they're like, Oh, whatever, dad. And they're like, Oh, but that's fake. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? That's fake. And they're like, well, it's obviously not real. And I said, how do you know? How do you know when the 75 year old man that otherwise I admire in terms of his ability to be discerning and wise doesn't know psychologically what it is, is developmentally, we respond to sort of our niche in a way that we construct reality in relationship to the world that we're inhabiting. Um, and we're at this generational point where uh, a certain generation didn't, they're not natives to this. Right. And so they actually have a more a difficult time discerning what's real, what's not, um, what's effective, what's not, than our six-year-olds. Mm-hmm. So part of the challenge, I think, is drawing now, okay, now who are the natives and how do they teach us the ways to discern truth from falsehood? Um, and then how does that feed up to someone like you who's actually making the advertising um, uh, effective or not? So anyway. Yeah. All right. We got one more question. 
So I haven't seen the whole documentary, obviously. So this is kind of based off like the little snippet. And I'm asking more kind of what happens next and what your research took you deeper than that. Um, my theology and my worldview is that what's under nationalism is sexism and white supremacy. And what's under that is capitalism. So I'm just kind of wondering like how you saw capitalism and sexism and patriarchy intersect this idea of nationalism and if that's something you explore later on in the film um i'm I'm not sure if i would totally agree with your assessment like i think underlying nationalism is fear ultimately and that it may express itself in sexism or racism or violence or something like that but i think that um yeah so i where does the film go next i i think it goes to an exploration of 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 what is motivating this uh, this adherence to violence, this adherence to national identity, and, and really what it gets at is fear. And my sense is what is, I think it gets also down to what is the nature of the gospel? Uh, what is the good news? What is the central problem that human beings are wrestling with? And again, I'll, I'll say one of my big uh, mentors is Ernest Becker, author of The Denial of Death. I think fear of death is so central to everything about us and uh, that um, this is what, uh, you know, that we're, we're constantly trying to sublimate this fear and oftentimes other people pay the price for that. So what the film really gets into is what, uh, get, gets down to that bedrock level of fear and then how do we move forward? Once we kind of can confront that fear, how do we deal with that in a healthy way instead of dealing with it in a way that's very destructive? So the one thing I was thinking about that question is the way the modern subject, uh, it is what we think of as a self was so formed by the emergence of nation states, um, of literate subjects who we imagine to be free rational agents who have a type of autonomy that in a collective makes good decisions. So as a nation state emerges, it's the same time Protestantism emerges uh, when it comes to the religious sphere, and that's the same time democracy emerges politically. Um, and capitalism emerges economically. So when we start to look at the way perverse power shows up in late modernity or the death of our current regime, um, then, then I think it's the, when we have, depending on the theory, you will isolate the perversity showing up in either religion, politics, or the economy. Um, but if you look historically at the shift from medieval Europe into what came to be Western modernity, uh, the same thing happened then. They located perverse power in religion and in the, in the political order and, uh, in the economic order as it's changing, uh, which I think invites us to both be attentive theoretically to the way oppression and violence shows up, but also realize we're in the middle of choosing how we relate differently when Political structures no longer can tell the economy what to do. Capitalism tells the government what to do, and that's relatively new. And so when we see that big shift of the economy, religion, and state shifting, then um, I want to ask the question, what can I do with my own agency? And what you can do with your agency as a citizen and as a part of a religious collective or an activist collective is different than it used to be. Um, but we actually don't really know what, how we'll organize, uh, in the next a couple hundred years as things rework in light of the train wreck of our planet we're on. Um, so sometimes, uh, describing ideology and how it's at play short circuits us starting to go ahead and create habits of liberating and life-giving relationships in the networks we're in that can be the fuel for a more beautiful relationship for our grandkids when we have a different reorganization of political, mythological, and economic relations. Um, and, uh, That's yeah. beautifully said. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, yeah. so with that, I want us to clap and thank Kevin for being here and welcome Sarah Lane Ritchie to the uh, stage. Did you-